This morning I'm at Willow Creek interviewing Ed Bornson. <laughs> Ed, um, were you born in this valley here or when did you come Not here? Not very far from here. I was born right in Felsburg. My dad at that particular time was a foreman at the Gem Mountain Sapphires and uh, uh, I assumed that I was born in Felsburg. So <laughs> I've, I've been a, a resident of the area, well, all my life. Um, were, were your parents ranchers, or how did you get into ranching? Well, my dad was a miner up at the Gem Mountain Sapphires, and my mother uh, uh, came to work out there as a cook, and that's how they met each other. And uh, I was born in 1926, and I have two other brothers, and they... Uh, they're a little bit younger than me. One, one still survives. Norman is still alive, and John is dead. So, when did you um, start ranching, and how did you end up with this well, place? Well, I'll tell you. My dad acquired this place during the tough years of the depression. He had uh, had saved some money, and the banks went broke, and it appeared that that the money was gone except that the bank had uh, a huge amount of uh, real estate around here. And a man by the name of Featherman, who was a receiver for the bank, uh, approached him one day with a proposition that he trade the money that they that he lost in the bank for, for this uh, particular ranch property in lieu of the money, providing he dig some more money up. That's <laughs> how it was. And, but they were also willing to give him more land. At that time, this uh, ranch property was uh, grazing ground here. Around here, could be bought from anywhere from one to two, three dollars an acre. So the values that's in this ranch, investment values, are, are very low by today's standards. Did you attend school in high school in Phillipsburg? No, I never went to high school, but I. Uh, Grades one, two, and four, I went to school in Phillipsburg. Three, and five, six, seven, and eight country schools right out here. It's how it was. How many kids were in the small country schools? <laughs> well, the one that, that, that we had school right in our bunkhouse at one time. The teacher lived right, right up the valley, and there were just three of us. So instead of having a having to go two or three miles to school, it was just imperative that they just move it right down here and we had a spare bunkhouse and, and we just lived right at home. Then uh, up, up the valley farther, the Lucci families, they were starting to grow up, so then they had to move the school back up about roughly three miles from here. Right. For uh, oh, part, part of this, that period, we used to ride horseback from here and then Later on, when my brother Norman and I were seventh, eighth grade, then we started driving a car. It's out Um We're not a questions, Maris. Um, I see there's a beaver slide right down here. Did that belong to you guys? Did you ever use oh, that beaver yeah. slide? No, that, that, that's the way we put up hay until recently. I think we've probably been bailing probably the last seven, eight years, but up until that time. And if you want to go back far enough, when we first moved onto this ranch, 1936, we used a lot of horses around here. The bull raking was done with horses, the raking, the mowing. And then somewhat later, we progressively got into the machinery business. We got a first tractor here in 1946. And then we acquired my brother, lives on a, on another ranch up uh, up on the main rock creek mm -hmm. and we acquired some more assets and and we run the two layouts together is how it is and finally we were putting up hay exclusively on a with a beaver slide and power bull rakes and mowers and stuff like that the big change today is instead of stacking with a old beaver slide why we make them round bales and and they're before the these operations were pretty labor intense. Now all of a sudden, we get by with three, four people 
And if we wanted to make a night a little farther, why well, we could probably get by with two, three. Mm -hmm. How many, how many acres do you have, Ed? On this place here, about 3,000. Wow. Are you going to run it forever, or are you going to let somebody else take it over? <laughs> well, I've got a son, and, and he's got three children that that basically live here. But Hans makes the bulk of his living out as a surveyor. And, and right now, during hay and time and some other period during the year when when I need some help, why then they always pitch in and help me. Cavan is a period during the year when you have to have more help. But I'm fortunate I I still uh, feel that I do printer what I've always done. Okay. Uh, I guess the day will come when, <laughs> when you won't be able to do it. But I think I feel better doing something. Right. I'd, uh, I'd hate to and that may come yet too, but I, I'd hate to spend a lot of time in a rest home with a lot of time on my hands. Out here, why, I do just about what I want to, and that includes, well, it includes everything that goes on in the ranch. It's a, a ranch is, I think a lot of people look upon the ranch as, as a, a wonderful place to live, which it is. But basically, it's a it's a business. It's a small business. You either manage things properly and and stay afloat. I've I've uh, just recently come come to the conclusion that that on these ranches we have two uh, two types of money. We have the type of money that these places generate, and this is what we've always lived on, paid our bill, and then all of a sudden. The, the assets and what they're valuable and what they're worth today, which is an entirely different figure. It has nothing to do with, with what they'll generate. And it's, it's kind of bad because while on paper it shows us wealthy people, uh, to be able to hold on to them is going to be real difficult because we can pass it on, hopefully. But the Internal Revenue Service, with their estate practices, just about, I won't say they'll destroy us, but they could, because all of a sudden the land values that land that was bought for two, three dollars an acre, some recently sold for three thousand, and uh, this is the values that uh, the government uses for estate purposes. So, I think pretty much any anybody with ranch assets, particularly in this area. Uh, are, are going to have some difficulties down the road, unless unless I survive like Mary Jensen to a hundred. <laughs> Give me a little more time, why then <laughs> then uh, the government allows you to so much a year toward a deduction, you know, on your inheritance taxes. But then the government also periodically they change the law. Right. Uh, did you raise um, hands and stuff in this house? Was Hans raised in this house? Right. Well, yes. I'll tell you, my uh, Hans's mother died when he was 17 months old, and my mother was still alive. She was a fairly old lady, but uh, he had a good home to come to, and I was able to be around. So my mother more or less took care of him until he was about 10 years old. He had uh, another grandmother in Philsburg that uh, my mother didn't take, she took care of him. And then as he got older, well, basically he took care of himself. His he, uh, he done real well in school. He uh, spent four or five years in Bozeman, spent some time in California working for a construction outfit down there. But uh, uh, the, the my people, uh, lifestyle was over up here. Finally he and his wife, and by that time they had two girls they decided to come home. And there would come a matter of deciding what he's going to do around here. And fortunately, uh, an opportunity to buy a surveying business from Bill Barron Felsford presented itself. And about his living made as, a, as an, well, an engineer and a surveyor. Uh, and in spare time, I mean, <laughs> well, it all works out. Um, do you have any cold calving stories? You yeah. sure? Cold winters <laughs> here must be pretty mild, huh? No, I will tell you one that happened just last spring. I'm uh, 76 years old, uh, 
It's <laughs> about the reason that I, I couldn't have got hurt. But I had a cow head calf down here in a, a, some willow and some fair deep snow, and I had straw. When there was a straw, unbeknown to me, the cow was on the light, and all of a sudden she hit me, knocked me down, I was trying to maul me around, and, and <laughs> for a sec or two, you didn't know just what the end result was going to be. But fortunately, just that quick, she quit. And I was able to get up and, and get out of the way. And at that time, I didn't realize that, that she hit me as hard as she had. But, but for about a month there, I had a leg on with black and blue about that big around. And fortunately, she never broke no bone. So I think my lifestyle would have really changed had she broken my leg. But when, uh, you live around here and you, you uh, work with the animal and uh, possibility of getting hurt. Or always been. not not so much from the ant. Horse a horse is dangerous to ant. Everybody look on a horse a great friend, but a lot of opportunities you get hurt on a horse. Falling and throwing you off. So uh and I had a neighbor up here tipped a tractor over on him. This was years ago. Severed his leg. And these are ranch incurred type things, you know. So and he was at full devil. He he survived that and was successful for up until about 85 years old. So there's a lot goes on. Then there are some around that, you know, they don't, they don't abide those accidents. You say farming is about the most dangerous. Yeah, profession. for, for uh, industrial accident insurance, it's higher, higher than a man underground in the wine. Mm -hmm. So uh, it doesn't appear to be dangerous, but some, some of it's due to the way certain people decide to live, they're, they're haphazard. As you get a little older, you, you get more cautious. You can't, you, you can't do the, the, the things that a young man would do. That's probably the big reason you're more cautious, you know. So. Um, has ranching gotten more easier and more enjoyable as time goes on with all the new machinery you know, and equipment? Everybody, everybody looks back on, on the depression and uh, so supposedly tough time. I don't recall ever a time that I thought things were tough. I uh, I think it had a lot to do the, with the type of parents I had. They they got by with what they had, and I, we we uh, I don't think we ever thought we were wealthy, but uh, uh, at least most most of our lives, why we never felt pressed like we were going to lose it or anything like that. So uh, I guess I guess as you go through life, why the early years of your life uh, were no better, no worse than what they are today. Is how it is. Do you like all the new machinery and the four wheelers that you use for your well, game and stuff? Well, yeah, I'll tell you, it's expedient to have them because they, uh, in my particular case, with more, no more than this the flick of a wrist, you can run a hydraulic system that'll lift a 2,000 pound bale, <laughs> another piece of equipment that unspools it that got a heater in, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, air conditioning during the summer. <laughs> no, no, it, uh, well, I think what it boils down to is we, we wouldn't be able to, to get by if it wasn't for that. So what you do as as uh, time goes by, and there's another opportunity to make it a little easier, if you have the they have, you have the means, because that that's another big thing. This equipment is expensive. Gene. Yeah, it is. So. Huh. Can you think of anything? Um, how about during the war years? Was it was it easy? I'll tell you. you during the war, no, I uh, I wasn't take wasn't able to pass an army physical, and. Uh, there was a short period, uh, maybe a long period afterward, particularly during the war, when I, uh, I felt that uh, it had something to do with a my heart condition. It appeared that maybe I wouldn't live to be very old, but by golly, I, I think I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm getting by pretty good. Did your brother Norman go to war? No, neither one of us. We had uh, my brother John was drafted during the Korean War, so he spent two months, or two months, two years in the Army, and I think probably the better part of a year in 
in South South Korea is how it looks. Mm. Connie was telling us a story yesterday that when we he went for his physical, he swears they mixed his papers up because they said he had a heart murmur. And he knew he didn't, but he said, oh, yeah, I do, and it really bothers me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he didn't get well, it sent out. He didn't have to go to the infantry. At that, at that particular time, because uh, I won't say that people were looked upon as second class, but if, if you weren't a soldier and part, part of it, I, I never felt any resentment toward me, but it, down deep inside of me, it, it, it seemed like, like I was, uh, was get, getting some favors that, that the rest of them weren't, you know. Although I look back on it, I know two neighbors up here that never come home. I know some others around that mentally impaired by a war. I know some that spent, uh, well, they're in veterans' hospital, legs gone, arms gone. But when you're 17 years old, you never, you never think of that. I read an article just lately that one of the big aircraft carriers out in the, in the Persian Gulf, the average age is 19. Can you imagine that? These were the, these were the type of people that were, were, were the soldiers and the, Marine, and the Marines and running the world. Mm -hmm. And bombing the hell out of the world too. Yeah. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, do you have any any other s stories you think that people might appreciate oh, your, well, about prohibition or I don't oh, know. I was too young. You were too young during for that. prohibition, so they they didn't affect me that much. Uh, I guess I guess if you. Give me a t an opportunity a day or so to spin a yarn or two. I I could probably do that, but off the cuff, it, yeah. it'd, it'd be kind of. I'd I'd want it to be factual and yeah. and just 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 to fabricate one here. Why <laughs> that's not my thing. I'll ask you something. You know, you, we drive way the heck up here, and how the heck did you build? your folks build their house? Did you guys mill your oh, lumber and stuff? This particular house has been here for about a hundred years. It, uh, the out exterior of it doesn't appear to be a log house, but inside it's all logs. And then, like a lot of these old log houses, to make them a little more livable, warmer, they put drop siding on and then inside some insulation. And this is another thing that has changed. The way we used to heat, we used to get out with horses, probably 15 to 20 cords of wood every year, and heated with wood. Now, uh, yeah, I still heat with wood. I, I uh, don't have to get it out with horses, bucket up with a chainsaw, and bring in, if you can find some old dry snags around here, mm -hmm. bring, it, bring it in and split it. And, and I've also got some auxiliary heat to fall back on. Uh, propane invent that's always there to turn on automatically so while that old house can get pretty cold why when it gets cold enough why you close three or four doors and live in just part of it but I I feel that I have just about everything that everything that I want I have a microwave I have an answering service I have electrical stove I don't know maybe it isn't uh, uh, two years old, some of us quite older than that, but uh, I feel comfortable under the conditions I live. And when I get good and hungry, why, and want a decent meal, why, my uh, daughter-in-law has, has me up for dinner, or I'm independent enough to where I can get in my car and drive into town. So I get, I think I get by real well. I. Uh, one one statement I would make, I have a lot of faith in the medical profession. I've had open heart surgery, I've had gallbladder surgery, I've had uh, prostate surgery, I've had a choroid surgery on my neck, I've had a lesion taken off. But all those things have left left me with a quality life. And functionally why I'm not in a wheelchair yet. <laughs> Well, that's a fortunate thing to be, you know. Oh, that'll be terrible. That'll be terrible. I think people that live in the cities are 
I'm glad they live there because they're all bunched up and they're not bothering me. Yeah. You know, I don't think that quality of life when you get old. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I talked to a man here just the other day that lives down in Florida. Boy, he said, I just got to get out of here. That's all. And it get, this is why Western Montana has, has uh, apparently got a great appeal because uh, you still have quite a lot of freedom and independence, and you don't, you don't really have people uh, elbow to elbow around here. You've got quite a lot of privacy. Right. Do you think you have any more questions? Well, I think you've just about. I think we wore it out. I told told me, <laughs> asked me to tell you about everything that I know. We started making him lie. We better turn him off. Yeah. Either either like they say, keep on because I haven't told you half of what I know, but I'm the other way around. Yeah. <laughs> so.